everybody. Welcome back to the Tipsy Ghosts. We're your tipsy hosts, Sarah, Sarah, and Lindsay. Hey, guys. Hello. You have recently recommended a movie for me. Well, it's supposed to be for both of us, but Lindsay has not watched it. I told her not to watch it. Oh, did oh, you? you told me not to? <laughs> I, I told her. Part. I didn't. I think I said I don't recommend it. I knew I it was. I don't remember hearing that. I remember saying. It was saying, not her cup of tea. Well, that is true after seeing it. <laughs> but I don't. You can tell me. You can spoiler alert. Or spoiler. Because I'm not going to watch it. <laughs> I can spoiler alert Spoil- it. Spoiler alert is spoil. You can give spoilers. Okay, there we go. <laughs> you okay? <laughs> I'm just. I don't know how to say words. <laughs> Maybe okay. I need to step away from the books. <laughs> <laughs> Never take a step back. Not going to happen. Back to this movie. So I specifically remember you saying you have to watch it. It's the best movie ever. No, no, no. I did not remember that at all. <laughs> Absolutely not what I said. I, I think said, we're talking about bad movies. <laughs> I said it I know, is terrible. You need to watch it. That's what it was. And I waited for a while, mostly because I forgot. And then um, I watched it. Um, and this movie is called... Matriarch. Matriarch. It's On Hulu? Hulu. It's a Hulu original. And how was it? Okay. Um, you know what? I was expecting worse. Okay. I <sighs> set you up for the worst of the worst. You were setting me up for the Winchester house. I was going to ask, better or worse than Winchester? I still don't think that one's as terrible as we say it is. The Winchester house? Yeah. It's giving Goosebumps 90s I vibes. love Goosebumps 90s. Like, are you afraid of the dark? <laughs> yes. Are I'm you- not talking shit about those things, but I'm just saying those are from the 90s, 30 years ago. Listen, I love the 90s. Are you? You're not picking up what I'm laying <laughs> down here. It's time for cinematography to get with the time. I gotcha. <laughs> Tell me about Matriarch. What did you think? Matriarch, um, the cinematography was with the time. Okay, we were there. What is Matriarch about? Yes, what is it about? What is a Matriarch mother? about? It is about a young lady who appears older than they make her to be. She's, I was confused by that. Yeah, she's older than stated age. She was supposed to be a middle-aged lady, but her mother also looked to be a middle-aged lady. It was a confusing time. Okay. Okay, so the main the main character is a young lady that is having uh, problems with addiction. So she decides she's going to move back home okay. with her mom. Okay. Who she's got this estranged relationship with and hasn't spoken to in 20 years. And somehow her mom reaches out to her. She just knows. That it's time because um, the daughter, this person has had an overdose. Okay. Mm -hmm. And during her overdose, you see her crash to the ground and she essentially dies. And then all of a sudden this pool of black liquid comes through her nostrils. No. And it's the demon. And then she's awake. Right. Well, (laughs) is it? I don't know. No. The answer is (laughs) no. It's not demon juice. Okay. Um, So then she gets this phone call from her mom and decides to move back home. Okay. And things are weird when she gets home. She notices that nobody in the town has aged. So maybe that's why I'm confused because mom looks the same age. Oh, we're M. Night Shyamalan. 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 I was trying to make dong. it into a verb, but it didn't work. <laughs> yes. But we're going down that path. Yeah, nobody's aging um, in the town except for this poor girl. <laughs> She's like, why do you all look the same age as me? And nobody else is aging. Okay, so this is weird. Things are going on. You don't really need to know what happens in the rest of the movie except for the end. <laughs> yes. Okay. Because the so whole time I'm like, what's the problem? This is okay. And then we get to the end and I'm like, what in the fuck <laughs> is happening here? I could have at least used a head heads up. Oh, no. No, you have to go into that blind. So you get the – you. it's very clear, right, that this whole thing about people not aging. And then you start noticing things are happening like people's skin is peeling off. And there's like some time constraint happening. They're like, uh, it's like some hurried panic. We need to get this thing done. But you don't know what it is. And then all of a sudden, mom's like, I, I have to go to the middle of town. And I'll be back later. And daughter's like, why are you leaving? So she follows her to town. Okay. okay. And she follows her to church because they're going to have church service at night. And daughter climbs up on something and looks into the window. And what she sees is Something I wish I could bleach from my brain. Demon juice. No. Basically. It's, it's worse than demon juice. I don't even know if this is appropriate to say. On, We're on not going to put all of this in here for spoilers, but. Oh, no. Spoiler alert. This is what happens. Okay. Spoiler alert. This is what happens. Mom is leading a quote unquote church service. And there are. For healing. For healing. Because yes. okay. everybody's skin is falling off. And sure. she's got to That's heal the problem. them. That's a problem. But you, how does she heal them? You wonder? An orgy. 
She does heal them with an orgy, but first she takes off her gown and her nipples start bleeding black liquid and everybody comes to suck from these bleeding black liquid nipples. Demon juice. And then there's an orgy. And the daughter's just watching like, what the fuck? (laughs) (laughs) So they drink the demon juice from her nipples. mm -hmm, I'm ignoring that part, but (laughs) demon juice. And then they have an orgy. Yes. And then what happens? Do they all well, get Well, it's healed? like the, those who drink the demon juice from her nipples, then they can have an orgy with people who did not drink yes. the demon juice so that and they pass can pass on. on the juice. <laughs> the juice. Mom also has a diary of- I already regret using the word demon juice, but it's <laughs> totally a- accurate. <laughs> the devil's juice. Don't get mad at me, listeners. This is a real movie on Hulu. I- I didn't write this shit. So what happens after the orgy? Um, well, are they all healed? There's kind of a confusing part about like this mother figure that's like in the green room. The green room? <laughs> yes, I don't know. It's like outside. They try to drag her out there and give her back to this thing that just cre- comes from the ground. It like comes up huge and it looks like this lady who's not scary at all. You know who she reminded me of? It was um the end of Moana. Mm-hmm. When the the island, yeah, is the fire island. It looked. Yes. Like she kind of reminded me of that lady, but like kind of see through and with lots of boobs. L- lots of boobs. Yeah, she had like six, six or eight. I'm not sure. <laughs> I told you guys this was a terrible movie. <laughs> it was. We were doing okay up until like the last thirty minutes, and I was like, "What? Hang I'm on. not following." Like she's like a goddess or something, but evil. And she's, demons from the demon juice. She's responsible for the demon juice because she got six boobs. Yes, I have seen so many terrible movies uh-huh. that I made a terrible movie list. Oh, of course you did. <laughs> the most recent one I recommend you watch, knowing uh, that this is a terrible movie. Okay, can you make it a shared list? Yes. Okay, it's dash cam. I've heard of this one. Never heard of it. Also on Hulu. I'm not going to tell you a damn thing. You and need I, to get off Hulu. You didn't tell me anything <laughs> about... I did. I warned you that there were orgies. Like weird I didn't hear about the orgies. Orgies. Just... And the boob juice. I was not I aware. Didn't, I, that was a fun surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> I was like, what is happening? <laughs> no. Dash cam. Watch it. And just know I'm recommending this as a terrible movie. Mm-hmm. Only okay. if you promise to watch Pilgrim. <laughs> I will. Okay. I will watch Pilgrims. You guys keep watching these bad movies. I'm just going to keep reading my books. <laughs> okay, fair. It is entertaining. It honestly, it really is. Like at first, I was mad, and then I was like, "All right, let's just keep watching." I mean, we're in it now. It's like I'm just I'm here for it now. <laughs> I've committed. Got to see it through. Yeah. Okay. Make it a shared list. I'm going to add to it. Yes. I definitely have uh, Pilgrims on there. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Anyhow, now you don't even have to watch it because I've explained it all. Thank you. Speaking of weird uh, movies and possessions. Or horror movies. One of the most classic movies. Also, if you look back on it, kind of weird. Definitely Kind of weird. weird for its time, especially. Yes. We're going to talk about the true story behind The Exorcist. Also known as? The Exorcism of Roland Doe. So this is all a movie we have seen, right, Boydston? Yes. Okay, good. I will say I was a teen. It's been a few years. That's okay. You've seen I it. I have seen it. It is a classic. It is one of my top five favorite movies of all time. What? And here's why. It's because it was one of the first horror movies that I really loved because I also was in high school, I think. They re-released it back into the theater and... I didn't know anything about it. Like, I know it came out in the 70s, but right. it's just like, I had no interest in watching it. And then when it came back into the theaters, I watched it for the first time. I didn't, I had no idea what it was going to be about. <laughs> and man, I was like, just, I was shook, shooketh, if you will. For that day and age, this movie was graphic. Yeah. Yeah. And even still, you're like watching it like, oh, this is an old movie. It can't be that scary. And And looking back on it, it's really not, but like. It was. And <laughs> it was back scary. Then it was, yeah. I saw it, like you said, high school, probably. And yeah, it terrified me in high school. The scene when she crab walks down the stairs will forever me. live in my head. <laughs> startled me so bad. I did, had no idea it was coming that I literally was just like kind of laughing and crying at the same time. <laughs> oh my gosh. So I was like, I don't know what to think about what is happening. <laughs> I felt the same way because in the grudge, she kind of oh, comes yeah. down the stairs like that. Yeah. Both of those terrified me. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I love I love it for that reason. It was the first movie that I remember getting like a really good scare. There's other parts that are very graphic. Yes, yes, there are. That are shocking. That I I cannot get out of my yeah. brain. <laughs> yes, <laughs> too. That is a shocking one as well. Um, so we're going to talk about the real life exorcism that inspired the book, and then later the movie behind the exorcism. Let's do it. So who is Roland Doe? Who you, is he? You might ask. <laughs> <laughs> I've been wondering. This is a great question for over 70 years. Nobody knew. After the exorcism, which we get into in just a few, he was known to most under a pseudonym. A pseudonym, you say? That's a fake name. Roland? Roland. Doe. (laughs) Doe. Is that real? Also, neither (laughs) neither are real. So with that, many details of his story were fabricated. So the story that we know throughout the years is probably a little bit real, but mostly not real. And several people had to work pretty hard to deduce the truth of it all. So what I'm saying is that Rolando is not the real name of the boy we will be talking about. It's also not Robbie Mannheim. Uh, That's another pseudonym pseudonym that (laughs) came up along the way. A pseudonym, if you will. (laughs) <laughs> Proceed. <laughs> Very few people knew the real name of Roland slash Robbie. The boy in question's real name was Ronald Hunkler. They are so clever. Roland. They kept the R-O. Ronald. Yeah. Just going to flip some letters around. Nobody will ever know. ro <laughs> These are hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I wasn't even looking at her. I was looking at you. (laughs) You inspired us. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Including me. I appreciate it. Uh, He was born in 1935 to a German Lutheran family, and they lived in Cottage City, Maryland. Sounds fun. Mm -hmm. He was an only child, so without having any siblings, he gravitated towards his aunt Tilly, who sounds like a blast. She was a spiritualist. And she introduced him to the Ouija board and eventually would teach him how to communicate with spirits through the board. January 1949, 13-year-old Roland or Robbie or Ronald, who do we want to call him? I refer to him as the boy. Okay. (laughs) Or we can do Roland. (laughs) not helpful. Roland. Okay, Roland. Roland it is. Roland started hearing strange scratching noises from his bedroom walls and floor, and the family was able to hear these as well. Um, pause. I am currently hearing scratching noises coming from my daughter's wall. Is she possessed? I'm wondering the same thing. If you see water dripping from the ceilings, <laughs> there is a problem. Demon juice. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's look at the more plausible explanation of it being a bat. God damn it. If you say a bat one more time, <laughs> I thought you were going to say a squirrel. No, I went with that because it's more fun. I think uh. it's a whole ba- battalion, battalion. <laughs> I couldn't even listen to it in there because it Ba-dum-tsh. gave me the ick. <laughs> gave me the ick. Look at you. <laughs> I've got a 14 year old. <laughs> <laughs> You're so with the times. No, no, no. <laughs> So she's possessed. Okay, got it. He. He is, yeah. No, I was talking about Ryan, but. Oh, oh yeah. Okay, yes. Yeah. Ryan's possessed. Roland's possessed. Yeah, starting to be. Let us know if she crap walks backwards down the stairs. Ooh, I definitely will. I'll cry. <laughs> but take video. <laughs> <laughs> we'll smack her and run into the other room. Like, absolutely fucking not. <laughs> Get out of here. You just tell her that. <laughs> I love you, Ryan, but do not crab walk down those stairs. <laughs> That I is bet. not allowed in this house. <laughs> She's going to hear that and try to do it. Uh, <laughs> she got mad at me once because I said something on here and she listened to it. Ryan, please crab walk down the stairs. Please uh-uh. practice. Start practicing now. <laughs> Don't hurt yourself. It's not safe, Ryan. Don't do it. <laughs> but if you practice, it can be fine. <laughs> and then do it at night. Uh-oh. Oh, my God. <laughs> You're dead to me, Lindsay. Okay. <laughs> So they also heard the sound of water dripping, and occasionally water could be seen dripping from the pipes and walls without any true explainable source. They reported that objects would fly across the room and that his bed moved while he was asleep in it, and as did a number of other objects. And finally, there were unexplained scratch marks on his skin, which kind of escalated a little later. 
His mother thought that this could be potential poltergeist activity by his Aunt Tilly, who had recently passed away. She thought maybe the boy had summoned Aunt Tilly via the Ouija board uh, because Tilly herself had taught him how to use it. So the family took him to physicians and psychiatrists, and he was subjected to a number of tests. But they all failed to find anything that might explain the allegedly paranormal phenomena. Then they went to a minister at their Lutheran church, uh, Reverend Luther Miles Schultz. Schultz? There's Question an, mark? There's an E at the end. I don't know. Schultz. Uh, Schultz, yeah. Schultz, sure. Uh, I love that he's a Lutheran named Luther. Yes. <laughs> he said, uh, hey, you guys should go to a Catholic priest because, quote, the Catholics know about this kind of thing. True. Um, as a side note, some sources say that he was Lutheran. Some mention Protestant. I really think it's Lutheran, but either way, he referred him on to the Catholics. I also like that he asked the boy to stay the night with him so he could observe him. I'm like, this would literally never fly in 2023. Yeah. Times have changed. Times have changed. Yeah. What is this, yeah. the Boy Scouts? I have to sleep right next to him on the floor. <laughs> yes. It's like, Let mm. me just watch him sleep. <laughs> no, never. Mm. So they go to a local priest, a Father E. Albert Hughes, who gave them a bottle of holy water and some candles and yeah, sent them on their way. <laughs> Do you think they were scented? Ooh. No, what was those the scent? candles probably aren't scented. Ooh, 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 what would it be scented? Jesus. Heaven. And how does Jesus smell? Clouds. Great. <laughs> Great. Um, Heaven. Clouds was my next one. Clouds. Milk and honey. Heaven's gate. Frankincense and myrrh. Ooh. Okay. Anyway, so. <laughs> candle, I like all those. Candles and holy water. <laughs> we don't know how they smell. I don't know. <laughs> probably scented. <laughs> TBD. <laughs> oh, all the while, his, his symptoms are worsening as the mysterious scratches on his body has escalated into carving of actual words. They go back to Father Hughes and they're like, hey, you see this? Your scented candles did not work. Um, and so <laughs> Father Hughes then asked the archbishop for permission to perform an exorcism on Roland. He does, and during this, Roland breaks off a mattress spring and uses it to slash Father Hughes, quote, from shoulder to wrist. That sounds very painful. It really does. Um, he would later explain how chairs moved with the boy in them, and one even threw him out of it. He said his bed shook whenever Roland was in it, and added that the home's floors were scratched and scarred from the sliding of the heavy furniture. Finally... Father Hughes described how a picture of Christ on the wall shook whenever the boy was nearby. The words carved into his skin soon became a sign. They said things like Louis, which his mother was from St. Louis. She was a native of St. Louis. St. Louis native. And, and they were in Washington, D.C. at this point. Maryland? They were in Cottage City. Well, but they conducted the first exorcism was at a hospital in D.C. Got it. The scratches also said Saturday and three and a half weeks, which is very specific. Um, a lot of scratches. <clears throat> so they were all taken as a sign. And soon the family relocated to St. Louis, where their relatives were, so that he could be treated for demonic possession. Finally, a few key players coming up. Father Raymond Bishop, S.J., which SJ is the Society of Jesus or Society for Jesus. Of Jesuits. Je yeah, Jesuits. Uh, also, the initials behind the name of any Jesuit priest. If you're remotely religious, please don't look as, look up SJ in Urban Dictionary. It's, Why would you look it up in Urban Dictionary? <laughs> I, I, I asked Google, like, what does SJ stand for? And that was the second answer. Pretty blasphemous. So okay. Just don't look it up. I'm not going to look it up. You just live in we'll your. We'll just tell you later. Live in your fantasy right. world. We'll just stay with Jesuit. <laughs> yeah, Father Bishop S. J. was a Jesuit priest who taught at St. Louis University. He was a participant in the exorcisms, and it was from his notes on the exorcism that we have even a little idea of what went on. Next is Father William Bowdern S. J., a Jesuit priest who would later go on to teach at Creighton University in Omaha. He was also a participant of the exorcisms. And finally, Father Walter Halloran, 
SJ. Also a Jesuit priest and the participant slash eyewitness to the exorcisms. All right, so we are going to start off, like we said, they are in St. Louis. This is about March 1949. So together, Bishop and Baldern, they visit Roland, and they observe the same things that were happening um, back home, which was a bed shaking, objects flying around the room, and they notice that the boy would speak in a guttural voice and would have an aversion to sacred objects. So kind of like what Boydson said, everything was still happening. Did you mention what the sacred object was? I did not. It was a piece of a bone. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. I did read that. I just didn't. I From, didn't I don't know, somebody of religious notoriety. And I was just fascinated that they had that. Mm-hmm. Other weird things that were noted, they saw a red X appear on his chest, which made them think there were 10 demons in his body because <clears throat> X, Roman numeral 10. There was still things that were appearing on his body, still words and things like that, but that was something that they noted specifically. They saw what looked like pitchfork-shaped patterns, so I'm thinking like three. Um, scratch- the devil's number. Oh, okay, yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, they didn't say that. They said pitchfork-shaped. I'm like, it's three. <laughs> <laughs> they just say three. <laughs> right. Um, but this red lines that would move from his thigh all the way down to his ankle. Poor Roland. Roland. Just getting all scratched up. So at this point, after observing him themselves, Bowdern gets permission from the archbishop to perform another exorcism on March 16th. So they start the first exorcism, and I say first because they performed about 20 exorcisms over the next three months. Um, So it went on for a while. Sure did. Which is kind of typical of exorcisms. It's not just one and done. It takes a while sometimes. Yes. So the boy would be fine during the day, they noted. And then at night is when he would start to go into a trance and he would scream, yell, act wild, basically, and would never remember anything in the morning. So during this, the family asks if uh, they can convert Roland to Catholicism to strengthen the fight because he was Protestant at that time. So they converted him. After so many unsuccessful nights, the family took him to the Alexian Brothers Hospital in South St. Louis on March 21st. So he stays for just one night. They check him out. They send him home the next day on the 22nd. Walter Halloran, the other priest, he came to see him. He was at the psych ward of the hospital there, and he came to see him there at the hospital. They also have another priest that's called in, and that's William Van Roo. So on March 23rd, when he is released back home, um, Baldern arranges for the boy and his father to come stay at the college church rectory um, just for safety and so also they can kind of keep him under close observation. Halloran stated at this point that words such as evil and hell would appear on the boy's body scratched into his skin. His mattress continued to shake and he broke Halloran's nose during one of the exorcisms. I'm thinking right hook. He did something. Yeah, he he definitely did something. <laughs> he definitely did something. All right. Threw some elbows. <laughs> Threw some elbows. April 1st, the boy is converted to Catholicism, and he's baptized at the church rectory. And on April 2nd, the next day, he makes his first Holy Communion. Which, fun fact, what did we learn about baptisms and exorcisms today? Um, did you with, learn something? With we did. each baptism, you're technically receiving an exorcism. At the same time. That is the way it was worded. We did not interpret it as such. Like I said, lots of Googling was done. Each baptism. They're they're performing an exorcism at the same time. In a sense. Hmm. Okay. Which I feel like it's like, uh, I don't know, a new start, cleansing, everything. Getting rid of all the evil stuff. It's so. They can baptize at any time. It's not just. You can baptize at any time, yes. Yes. So, um, in my faith, you get baptized once and it's not as a baby. It's whenever you make the decision to become a Christian. And it symbolizes your new life with Christ. Yes. So, it says the old is washed away, the new is reborn. Yes. Basically, this random website I pulled up on Google says the minor exorcism at baptism does not presume the candidate is actually under demonic possession, but is part of the overall process of baptism in which the baptized one, quote, dies to all sin and is, quote, reborn in Christ. And I talk about minor, I talk about major exorcisms here in a little bit. So baptism is a minor exorcism. Correct. In terms of Catholicism. Okay. <laughs> I don't like that word with it, but okay. 
All right, so... I don't make the rules. I don't don't either. (laughs) I just Googled it, and that's what it told me. (laughs) On April 4th, um, so he makes his first Holy Communion on the 2nd. On the 4th, he goes back to Washington, D.C. with his parents, and Bowdern, and Van Roo. So two priests go with them. And I say they go back to Washington, D.C. because they're going back to, like, that area where the hospital was. Okay. But they don't stay long. Five days later, they return on the 9th back to St. Louis, and they go straight to Alexian Brothers Hospital again. So it's not really said what happens during those five days. Something must have happened that they took him straight to the hospital. Mm -hmm. The Monday after Easter, April 18th, um, the boy, Roland, he wakes up with seizures and he yells that Satan would always be with him. At about 1045 that night, the attending priests called on St. Michael to expel Satan from his body. They shouted, um, saying that St. Michael would battle him for Roland's soul. Seven minutes later, Roland came out of his trance and said, he's gone. The boy recounted later that he had had a vision that St. Michael vanquished Satan on a great battlefield. Wow. And after that, he was cured. Um, On August 20th of later that year, the Washington Post published an article by Bill Brinkley, and it was titled, Priest Freeze Mount Rainier Boy Reported Held in Devil's Grip. So this was one of the common misconceptions. He was not from Mount Rainier. (laughs) But that's what was published in the Washington Post. And later, this was this article served as the inspiration for The Exorcist, the book. So after The Exorcism, the boy was reported, went on to lead a rather ordinary life. So this exorcism kind of went all over. It started, obviously, in, you know, his hometown in Maryland. And then it went to this hospital in D.C., then to St. Louis, then to the hospital in St. Louis, Mm -hmm. then to the rectory, and then back to the hospital. Nobody knew what to do with them. Yeah, Mm -hmm. nobody knew what to do with them. Yeah. All right, so it has been said, um, obviously, that Roland was deeply disturbed. Others have said that there was nothing supernatural about him. One person described him as a spoiled and disturbed bully who threw deliberate tantrums to get attention or to get out of school. And a lot of this is reported by Mark Opsinik. I don't know if I'm saying his name right. Opsinik. I don't know. I could not tell you. Okay. Mark Opsinik. We're just going to go with that. Yeah. So he was a journalist who really deep dived into this whole story to try to find out the truth. And he stated that he spoke with Holleran, who stated that he had never heard the boy's voice change. And he thought that the boy just was mimicking the Latin words that he was hearing the priest say instead of all of a sudden being able to speak Latin on his own. He also said, Mark Opsinik said that, yes, there was marks on this boy, but nobody was checking to see his nails to see if he had done this to himself. Um, he also reported that there was really? no they evidence. I don't think he was checking his nails. I seriously doubt that. It wasn't recorded that they had checked it. Maybe sure. they did, but they didn't write it down. There was also no evidence to be found of the first exorcism that happened at the hospital in Washington, D.C. by Hughes or of Hughes's injury, which remembered he was... Oh, yeah. You know, mauled, basically. Which I had read that he had over 100 stitches on that arm. But no stitches. No no record of it. Who knows? I don't know, man. So, Obstinic also, he investigated it, and he found, obviously, that the exorcism did not take place in Mount Rainier, Maryland, like the article had said. And, in fact, the boy had never even lived there because he was from Cottage City. He said that nothing was really documented or fact-checked. Everything was based off hearsay. He said that there was no evidence that Hughes even visited the home. He said that he had him admitted to Georgetown Hospital in D.C., requested that he be restrained, attempted to exercise him, and was injured during the exorcism, supposedly, but never witnessed any of the events occurring in the home. He said people reported that Father Hughes, after the exorcism, suffered an emotional breakdown and left town without a trace, but that's not true. And there's a lot of evidence to back that up, that he didn't actually leave town. It's been reported that to psychiatrists who have studied the case that Roland Doe suffered from mental illness, and it's quoted, to psychiatrists, Roland suffered from mental illness. To priests, this was a case of demonic possession. To writers and film and video producers, this was a great story to exploit for profit. Those involved saw what they were trained to see. Each purported to look at the facts, but just the opposite was true. In actuality, they manipulated the facts and emphasized information that fit their own agendas. I don't think he's wrong on that. I think definitely for movies. Yeah. But. Exploited and probably people did see what they wanted to see. Yeah. Opsinek also said that he spoke with neighbors and childhood friends of the boy and said that, quote, the boy had been a very clever trickster who had pulled pranks to frighten his mother and fool children in the neighborhood. 
He's Sounds little, like a normal kid. He's a little prankster. Yeah, he's a normal yeah. kid. That's quite an elaborate prank. <laughs> that is a very elaborate prank. Yes. He also said, quote, there's simply too much evidence that indicates that as a boy, he had serious emotional problems stemming from his home life. There's not one shred of hard evidence to support the notion of demonic possession, end quote. Another skeptic, Joe Nickel, wrote, quote, a determined youth, probably even without a wall mirror, could easily have managed such a feat, talking about like scratching himself and scratching the words in, if it actually occurred. Although the scratched messages proliferated, they never again appeared on a difficult to reach portion of the boy's anatomy, end quote. So they always showed somewhere he could have done it himself. It's not like it was like on his back in the middle where he couldn't see, you know. The book that The Exorcist is based off of is Thomas B. Allen's book, Possessed, The True Story of an Exorcism. And like Boydson said, it's based off the diary by Raymond Bishop, who assisted with The Exorcism, and also interviews with Walter Halloran, who also assisted. So in 1990s, Allen, when he was writing this book, he actually became friends with Halloran. And he says that Halloran was never certain that the boy was actually possessed, But Bowdern, who also assisted, said, quote, the case in which I was involved was the real thing. I had no doubt about it then, and I have no doubt about it now. So who knows? Well, and I will say that I watched a documentary on Discovery Plus called The Exorcism of Roland Doe. (laughs) It's very clever. That's a very clever title for our episode. (laughs) (laughs) And um, somebody had interviewed, oh gosh, I'm probably going to butcher it. So I don't know the specifics enough to say names, but somebody had interviewed one of the priests that was involved at the hospital in St. Louis. Halloran, Bowdern, Van Roo. It wasn't anybody that was in the books. This was like somebody who decided to break their silence oath. Okay. Because he had cancer, he was dying, he felt like this needed to be said. Gotcha. And he was elderly, close to 80s, something like that. Mm-hmm. But he had been there at the hospital on there. So he was interviewed and he was talking about how it was the real deal and he yeah. got to see all the things that happened. Went down, which I do believe that there are probably things that happened that... Oh, of course. Maybe weren't said. <laughs> so anyways, I, I had questions. I have a lot of questions about okay. exorcisms, religions... And I have too many questions to be answered in this episode. It almost needs its own episode. So I just decided to just kind of define exorcisms in terms of Catholicism. So by definition, just so we are on the same page, exorcism is the practice of evicting demons, jinns, or other malevolent spiritual entities from a person or an area that's believed to be possessed. The type of exorcism depends on what the spiritual beliefs are of the person who's performing the exorcism. So it really, they're, they're supposed to be sensitive to the person who they're performing this on. Um, if they come from different religious or cultural backgrounds, but if they're the ones performing it, then they get to make the rules basically. So, which was interesting in Roland's case, because uh, that's part of the reason that they converted to Catholicism because the Mm -hmm. person doing it was a Catholic. Right. So the practice of exorcism is ancient and it spans across many different cultures and religions. And in Catholicism, exorcisms are performed in the name of Jesus Christ. It's a specific form of prayer that the church uses against the power of the devil. The following people can receive an exorcism according to the code of canon law. And forgive me if I butcher words. I'm just doing my best. You're okay. Oh, gosh, this word. Okay, I know Catholics can, but then catechumens? Mm-hmm. Is I saying that right? It's mm-hmm. a Christian convert. I had to Google it. Uh, Non-Catholic Christians who request it and non-Christian believers, if they have the right disposition, meaning they have sincere desire to be free of demonic influence. Um, the Catholic rite for a formal exorcism is called a major exorcism, so different than the baptism slash minor exorcism. Right. <laughs> Um, and it's given in section 11 of the Rituale Romanum. Okay, butchered that one in Latin. but That's okay. <laughs> sure tried. <laughs> I cannot speak Latin either, so you're doing great. <laughs> the ritual has guidelines of conducting an exorcism and helps to determine when a formal exorcism is needed. Take a shot every time we say exorcism, because it's a lot. You will already be drunk. <laughs> It can only be performed by a bishop or a priest with special permission of the local ordinary. The rite of major exorcism is only used when there's a case of genuine demonic possession. So here are some, but not all, signs that someone might be showing if they're possessed. 
They may have loss of appetite, um, cutting, scratching, biting of skin, cold feelings in the room, unnatural body positions, burping, belching, coughing, and yawning, which means we're all possessed here in this room, unfortunately. (laughs) A change in voice. Change in voice. (laughs) There it is. Thank you. That's That's perfect. perfect for it to come out. Supernatural physical strength, speaking or understanding languages that they didn't know previously, knowledge of events that they would have no way of knowing, levitation, intense hatred towards religious objects. And according to the Catholics, there are four different levels of possession. They can have demonic infestation, demonic vexation, demonic obsession, and demonic possession, which is when the demon takes total control of the body. And obviously that's the worst one. That's where we try to prevent. And all of this is kind of talked about with Roland's case, which is why I bring it up, especially all those signs and symptoms of right. possession. He had several. He did. Priests are told to make sure that the person is not suffering from any psychological or physical illness before proceeding, which I mean, no pressure to them. So yeah, they might take them to the doctor, but also it kind of falls on them to determine like, is this psychological, physical, or do we really think that this is a possession? And for somebody who doesn't have a medical background, I feel like that's a lot of pressure to put on somebody. Mm -hmm. So the actual, even if they take him to the church and the doctor says, oh, actually it's this, it's psychosis, or they have this type of diagnosis, the determination of whether a person is possessed by the devil is made by the church. And that's the final word. The person performing the exorcism is an ordained priest, and they recite the prayers according to the rubrics of rite and may use religious materials such as relics, which they often did, like the bone. Um, They invoked God, specifically the name of Jesus Christ. I think you said that, please. They will also call on members of the church triumphant and the archangel Michael. According to Catholics, the person may require weekly exorcism, which you mentioned, over many years. It may take a long time to expel a demon. The prayer of choice was usually St. Michael's prayer against Satan and the rebellious angels while holding the Holy Rosary, and they would often use holy water. The person was usually restrained so they didn't hurt themselves or others. The prayer or ritual is performed, and hopefully the person will feel a release of guilt or have a feeling of being reborn when the exorcism is done. So that's kind of what the exorcism is for what they were going through at that time. Now, I did kind of want to touch on The Exorcist, like we mentioned in the beginning with the book, The Exorcist. Lindsay already mentioned it, and I think Boyston maybe did too, but the movie came out in 1973. It was based on the book written by William Peter Blady, and it was called The Exorcist. Original. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I wanted to mention this because this film is known to be cursed. Dun, dun, dun. Rumors started almost immediately when the film was released that some disturbing things had happened on set. There were several injuries to some of the cast, including Linda Blair, who played Reagan, and Ellen Burstyn, who was Reagan's mother. They both suffered injuries that resulted in long-term back problems. There was also a fire that burned down most of the set, except for Reagan's bedroom, which was weird. Because that's where she played most of her possession scenes. It's very Mm -hmm. coincidental. Except for the crab walk scene. That was a different area. That was not, yes. (sighs) A man who played a nurse in the film killed a reporter before the movie was released. He confessed to the crime, but couldn't explain why he did it. So, also, I wanted to mention this because I just found it interesting that when the movie starts, you can see Father Marin... Um, discovering the amulet of Pazuzu during an archaeological dig in Iran. It comes up later um, in the film that during Reagan's possession that she's actually possessed by Pazuzu. And I like to point that out because a lot of people think she was possessed by the devil, but she was not. It was by Pazuzu. You guys remember my story about the Pazuzu killer? Yes. Thank you, Boydston. (laughs) The Pazuzu killer. It sounds familiar, but... like this guy in this, like, nice house that threw parties all the time, but... Yeah, he, like, destroyed it. Yes, 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 yes. And it was, like, disgusting hoarder-level house with poop everywhere. Yes. Yes, I remember. Yes. I do remember. It's been a long time. It has been a long time. But that's why I found it interesting. Um, So it's just kind of another 
example of how it strayed from the actual story too. That I don't think Roland was possessed by Pazuzu. I don't think he ever said who he was possessed by. Which I googled it, but Pazuzu is not really that scary. Maybe don't don't come for me, Pazuzu. <laughs> I don't like, want to I mean, be he's a demon, but <gasps> he's known to scare off other demons. Like Sounds he's a like household a demon, <laughs> and he controls the winds. I feel like the devil's scarier, but what do I know? I feel like the majority of exorcisms they are not like it's not the devil possessing you. He has his demons. Yes. I feel like that are, it's normally other demons who are possessing. Got it. They, so they lie and say they're the devil? Or in fact, they're, that or they're representatives yeah, of the devil. They're coming in the devil's name. In the movie, she says, I'm the devil himself. But it, she says that because she's Pazuzu lying, I guess. Right. I don't know. I mean, a demons lie. things going into these movies. So when the movie was released, it was the highest grossing film to, at that time. Um, but there were reports of audience members getting physically ill and fainting while they watched the movie. One woman even blamed her miscarriage on the film because of the stress. Oh, I know. And, and people were just saying that anybody could become possessed during the movie by watching it because it was a path to corrupt human souls. I mean, that sounds about accurate for the 70s. I, I mean, that. yeah, in the 70s, it was probably a pearl clutcher. <laughs> I don't know that I'd yes. say like you can just be possessed. Yeah. Right. I agree. So what do you think? Was Roland possessed? Yeah, your name. Lindsay? You're the one who typically believes in possessions. I think he was. Interesting. Um, did you guys talk, or I guess you didn't, but talk at all about who Ronald Hunkler was, though, in real life? Like what he did with his life? Yeah. Ronald went on to become a member of NASA. He was a NASA engineer. He was a NASA engineer for over 40 years. He retired from that. He had a family. He had kids. Wow. And what's interesting is that he lived up until his 80s, 90s. And just before he died, out of nowhere, a priest came in and gave him his last rites. Like nobody said like, hey, Fam, like he's dying. Come, Ooh, I just kind of got to chill. Come say hey, why. but like <laughs> randomly, this mm-hmm. priest came in, gave him his last rites right before he died. That's so creepy. He died in November of 2021 um, because of a stroke at the age of 85, and they d- identified him or released his identity the next month, December. Yep. So they basically were waiting for him to die because he didn't yeah. want his identity revealed because he was a NASA him. engineer yeah. who lived in fear his whole life that someone would find out this was him. Um, but he patented a special technology to make space shuttle panels resistant to extreme heat, which led to the Apollo missions and led to us walking on the moon. That is very cool. Isn't that cool? Like that he went on to lead this like huge life and like basically, hey, sir, we can walk on the moon now because of you. You and your possessions have led us to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was telling Boydston a little bit about this earlier, but like. I've read a couple demonic possession books. Um, one that I recommend that is very good, but also one that I have never been able to finish because it is so terrifying is Hostage to the Devil. And it talks about modern day exorcisms in the church. And it goes into kind of like what you said, Sarah, a lot of detail about what exorcisms are, how you even get to the point of an exorcism. Yeah. Um, and then it goes through five different stories of exorcisms in modern day. And it's very good because it just talks about the history of exorcisms, but also like it makes you realize how much you have to go through to even get an exorcism approved. Yeah. You have to go through a psychological evaluation. A psychiatrist has to see you, a psychologist, a medical doctor has to do a complete workup. Yeah. You have to go through all of these things. So it's not like anymore where someone's acting crazy and they're just like, ah, exorcism. Yeah. You know, you have to be written off to say this is not due to a mental deficit or a mental illness. This is not due to a seizure or some other medical reason. Right. It's kind of like a, we can't figure out what's wrong with you kind of thing. Yeah. Um, But there's always one case that I get to and I can't finish it after that. I've tried to read it three times. Interesting. So I, my curiosity's peaked. I, I own the book. I will not be reading it. I will listen. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) My husband read it in college and that's how I like heard about it. Cause we all tried to read it in college. And he said it messed with his mind to the point where he would lay down to go to bed at night and he, like, couldn't sleep because he would start hearing things or it would mess with his mind. I'm not a particularly religious person, so it might be easier for me to read in that regard. Sure. But I am a believer of uh, spirits and other things beyond, so it would be interesting. Maybe I'll check it out. you know, evil spirits, demons, whatever you call them. Yeah. 
I'm on board. I think there, it sounds like there was something that was um, affecting him so much that all of a sudden, or not all of a sudden, because it took several exorcisms, but he was able to lead a completely normal life. Like no mental health, nothing going on there. Yeah, good point. Um, didn't follow him. Right. Whereas like someone who, if it, this was due to like a mental health, boys was asking me, you know, about schizophrenia and things like that. Yeah. If this was due to that. First off, schizophrenia, you can't really be diagnosed with that as an adolescent that doesn't show until your 20s secondly it's not something that goes away like he would not have been able to be a nasa engineer right if he had that i would say right but who knows yeah. what do you guys think i mean i definitely don't think he uh was just acting out Mm-mm. so whatever that means yeah i don't know i mean i'm inclined to think that it was some sort of possession i have no idea by whom but I think something happened, and Lindsay makes a good point. Like, he was able to go on mm-hmm. to live a normal life, and that says something to um, his mental health. Yeah, I agree. Food for thought. Food for thought. <laughs> we don't know. We don't know. <laughs> it's just, I think it's interesting. I think exorcisms are interesting because they have such a long history, and they're still done to this day. Yeah. They're not common. Um, by any means, like Hollywood makes it seem like it's a common thing. It's not a common thing. Yeah. You, I think there's definitely a lot of things that we aren't allowed to see and hear about. And we'd probably be horrified if we did. Yeah. But anyways, that is our story of one of the famous, most famous exorcisms in the U.S. history. And we can go drive by the house in St. Louis, guys. We can. Someone lives there, so we can't go inside of it. <laughs> but we can drive by. But we can drive by it. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe one day. <laughs> Thanks so much for tuning in this week to this episode. You can always find us at thetipsyghost.com with our socials linked from there or send us an email at thetipsyghost at gmail.com. Please give us a five-star rating and a great review anywhere you listen to podcasts. We really appreciate it and it really does help. All right, guys. Thanks so much. We will catch you next week. Okay, bye. Bye. Bye.